morning, a suspension bridge was built in Cholutika, Honduras. The bridge was originally constructed in 1930 and rebuilt in 1996. The Honduras government, knowing this bridge was likely to face extreme weather conditions, commissioned some of the best architectural minds in the world to build a bridge that could withstand high winds and hurricanes that plagued the region. Sure enough, in 1998, Honduras was hit by Hurricane Mitch that devastated the Caribbean. The city, the country was wrecked. Roads were wiped out. However, the Cholotica Bridge stood its ground and survived near perfect condition. The bridge stood its ground, but the storm caused the river to carve a completely new path, with, which no longer ran under the bridge. The Cholotica Bridge no longer stood over the river rendering it essentially useless, a bridge to nowhere that became irrelevant. Even knowing that a hurricane would eventually hit the country, the designers of the bridge were unable to anticipate future conditions under which the bridge would operate. The river had carved its own course and flew besides the bridge and not under the bridge. The brightest minds are unable to foresee how markets and behaviours will change and validate those assumptions such as the rule of nature. While we think we have aced the game, the rule changes. The tenacity, the tenacity in our planning and the astuteness of our self-proclaimed business algorithms crumble to the unforeseeable. 9-11 happened and it changed airport security forever. <clears throat> Most thought this was the worst. We weren't prepared to be drowned by the tsunami of 2004. And then 26-11 happened the tranquility of hospitality was shaken. What brings about this change is disruption, a force which by its very definition will catch us unaware. It will compel us to focus on what is at hand and not what we have in mind. It will throw our plans to the wind. No amount of adjustment of our sales will help. Disruption will challenge our very copability and not just our capability. Each crisis taught us something. And while we assumed we had learned to deal with such disruptions, the nature of the disruptor itself changed. The storm in Honduras that altered the course of the river is akin to our current pandemic, resulting in the world facing its worst ever economic fallout since the Great Depression of 1929. The sudden spread and severity of the pandemic across the globe has, has pushed countries and institutions into uncharted territory. 200 plus countries have reported COVID cases. 3 billion or one third of the world's population is under lockdown. The global GDP will contract to the extent of 3% with global unemployment at an all-time high. Never in modern history have countries had to ask citizens around the world to stay home, curb travels and keep physical distance. Though home ground has become the new playground, families are separated. Children cannot play outdoors, friends cannot meet, the faithful cannot worship together and communities cannot gather to celebrate important events. The world's population is living in fear and uncertainty, not only of physical illness, but also of the crumbling of livelihoods, communities and economies. Millions are struggling under financial strain, losing jobs and income, unable to afford daily necessities and despairing of the future. The suffering is widespread from loneliness, isolation, heartbreak, to anxiety, anger and despair. More than ever, our resilience as individuals as a society is vital for survival. Healthy minds, healthy habits, strong families, a caring circle of friends and supportive communities all strengthen our fortitude to cope with adversity, help others stay hopeful and emerge stronger from this crisis. Influences come in the form of opinions, attitudes, and then there are values. <clears throat> opinions are ripples on the surface, shallow and easily changed. Attitudes are the currents below the surface, which are deeper and stronger. Values are the deep tides, slow to change, yet powerful. It is a value change that causes a seismic shift, necessitating the society to reset its priorities. The Black Death ended federalism and serfdom. The World War II made US the most powerful nation. 9-11 reshaped transportation and security policies worldwide. 
DSA was born, 2611 D-shaped hotel security, and 2003 SARS saw a surge in online shopping. Lennon rightly said, there are decades where nothing happened, and there are weeks where decades happen. The world now has a much sharper definition of what constitutes a black swan event. Friends, we stand at the threshold of a new normal, witnessing the birth of a society with an unaccustomed relationship to the community and a new tryst with humanity. Health and hygiene becomes paramount, ushering in a new era of hotel service, attempting to make the invisible visible with low touch, no touch, contact light -like sanitized protocols, as they converge with social and physical distancing to establish a new norm. Hotels will have to redefine and repurpose their spaces, places and experiences arising from the dual concern of distancing and disinfecting, yet striking the right balance between connect and space. In 1943, American psychologist Abraham Maslow established a theory of human motivation based on hierarchical classification of five human needs which drive human behavior. Over the past decades, the hotel industry has evolved from focusing on primarily basic needs to higher order psychological and experiential guest needs. COVID-19 has redirected the attention to revert to basic needs of cleanliness, safety and security, albeit at an enhanced level. In our past lies a future is not about the hotel industry, but about reimagining tourism in its entirety. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that the global tourism industry has lost 320 billion in exports in the first five months of 2020, and 120 million jobs are at risk. A recent McKinsey study indicates that it will take four to seven years for the $9 trillion tourism economy to return to the 2019 level. Remember, tourism relies on the same mobility that spreads the disease. COVID can touch you anywhere. It's not brand conscious and loves everyone equally. Obviously, tourism, until tourism opens its doors, hotels opening their doors is going to have little or no impact. In the event of such uncertainty, the torchbearers of tourism associations faith with one eye on the microscope and the other on the telescope, outlined a systematic three-phased approach. A, survival, which is preserving our cash flows, our very lifeline. B, revival, <clears throat> looking at domestic tourism, the combined, the combined power of our 2.3 billion domestic tourists, coupled with 26 million Indians who travel outbound. And C, thrival, redefine India's offer to attract tourism international tourism by charting a new course. It is obvious that thrival for India will need to be more incredible than ever to take a larger piece of a smaller pie. In the previous periods of shock, such actions, both good and bad, are lodged in a country's history and fought perceptions that have endured for years. Decisions made during the crisis will likewise shape India's identity that will leave trails long after COVID-19 has been quelled. Questions have to be asked, rules rewritten, mindsets changed. Incredible minds will find a silver lining in the darkest cloud. Remember, a future unwritten is a future of opportunity, and uncertain times are catalysts for reimagination. Smooth seas never made good sailors, as a storm brings something out of us that calm seas don't. Crisis can be adrenaline for innovation, causing barriers that once took years to overcome to evaporate in a day. Entrenched orthodoxies are replaced overnight. Zoom became the Kleenex of the VC world. The sharing economy rose out of the 2009 crisis. We need to go beyond minor tweaks and make bold pivots. As the rest of the world rushes to find solutions, we in India already have our charter crafted and created centuries ago. While our scientific temperament will consistently innovate as we revisit the annals of history, our past holds the mirror to our future. The past is where you learn the lesson. The future is where you apply the lesson. There has never been a more appropriate time in the current era than the present one to apply the knowledge and lessons from an infinite treasure of our ancient heritage 
in the field spanning the entire gamut of civilization from wellness to science. To take one step forward, we need to take two steps backward. Everything old is new game. In the innovation-based, <clears throat> innovation-obsessed modern lifestyle, our ancient traditional practices based on the tried, tested, and trusted tripod could address all modern-day concerns arising from the pandemic and thus become the new beacon of light for tourism India. The vast knowledge bank created by our ancestors can be the Arth Shastra to reimagine incredible India. I call it our intellectual air balloon. The Vedas are the world's oldest form of literature. They're written in Sanskrit, India's ancient language. The language, like no other language, has built-in rhythm, melody, and expressiveness, and has unique properties of even enriching other languages that emanate through its awe-inspiring innate properties. Experts say it has a potential to revolutionize future use and applications of computer interface with human society. An outstanding example of the ability to repurpose. Today's concern of holistic healing is what India's intellect perceived and created as Ayurveda almost 5,000 years ago. Essential information on how to achieve a balanced and healthy life was recorded in the Vedas, specifically in the Atharva Veda. It is in this body of knowledge that India's ancient medical practice is comprehensively and systematically outlined. Ayurveda has always promoted preventive healthy living practices through daily and seasonal regime focusing on diets, activities boosting immunity, rather than depending on the reactive approach of modern Medicare using antiviral or antibiotics. Ancient Indians got a great importance to health and wellness derived from the practice of yoga too. The basis of all life's endeavors is swasthya. Let food be thy medicine. Eat according to seasons. Food that was grown locally and cooked in earthenware lent high levels of immunity. What many refer to as intermittent fasting was being practiced thousands of years back in India. The first meal at sunrise and the last meal at sunset. Indian gastronomy goes beyond rules to discover underlying gastro semantics, which can be understood as a culture's distinct capacity to redefine, capacity to signify, experience, systemize, philosophize, and communicate with food and food practices, rendering it as a central subject of attention. Our food is deeply grounded with five elements, five senses, three stands, three humors, six tastes, and nine feelings. As the Bhagavad Gita teaches us, you eat what you are, and you are what you eat. Moving to yoga, yoga is essentially a spiritually discipline, is a spiritual discipline based on an extremely subtle science which focuses on bringing harmony between mind and body. It is an art and science of healthy living. Yoga is also commonly understood as a therapy or exercise system for health and fitness. While physical and mental health are natural consequences of yoga, the goal of yoga is more far-reaching. It is the technology of aligning individual geometry with the cosmos to achieve the highest level of perception and harmony. As the global seat of yoga and Ayurveda, India can teach everyone the way to reimagine, to live and survive in surplus and sufficiency. Unlike modern modes of chemical fumigation and sterilization, Vedic culture always highlighted the importance of Havan Kriyas in living spaces. Samigri, used for the Havan in Indian households, included incense sticks, herbs, using many ingredients which purify the atmosphere and keep infections away. Hygiene, physical distancing, and isolation have been mentioned as an integral part of the daily living rituals in practice of yoga in form of its yama and niyama codes. <clears throat> Example, soch, ekantvas, and mon, or silence. Many of the things being promoted now worldwide as the norms for living to avoid being affected by the pandemic with the usual norms during the Vedic period, where strict forms or norms of hygiene were followed. The science of eating was visible in most homes, where family members sat cross-legged on the kitchen floor with hot and fresh meals being served, even as the humble pakar ensured low-contact dining. Clearly, our ancestors were way ahead of us. Washing hands, 
and a mouth mouth rinse post meals was naturally inbuilt in the dining process spaces were designed to support these practices we are now being told not to touch our eyes nose without washing hands in the manu smriti it is written without a reason don't touch your own indriyas eyes nose and ears annals of history show evidence of how self sufficient india was the gestanis the first ambassador to the world who came between 350 and 290 bc wrote that the indians have abundant means of subsistence exceeded in consequence the ordinary stature and are distinguished by their proud bearing they are also found to be very skilled in the arts as might be expected of men who inhale pure air and drink the very finest water in today's parlance you may refer to this as sustainability it should come as no surprise that india as a knowledge leader sought to share its intellect with the world for our vedic culture believe vasudev kutum kam meaning a world is one for all living and non living entities in the normal new normal well being will be best holistically we cannot be individually well in a world that is unwell planetary care will be as important as personal care any efforts to save the planet ultimately equate to saving ourselves yat pinde tat brahm mande is an ancient sanskrit verse from the puranas all that is outside you is within you whatever is in the microcosm is also in the macrocosm man is a miniature of nature and must learn to live in harmony therefore wellness and sustainability are intertwined health is the new wealth the pandemic has made us more aware of the critical importance of our own physical and mental resilience just in case principle being replaced by the just in time obsession the new normal will be built on the foundations of health safety and sustainability the more things change the more they remain the same as per indian philosophy shard darshan that truth is revealed only when one becomes sheer observers to any situation as a third party observer who is not attached to either attaining the shakshi bhav <clears throat> observing the current pandemic through the lens of shakshi bhav it is quite evident that except the human race rest of nature and its creatures are thriving and blooming during the covid phase with improved air quality pure water channels rivers or seas clearer skies dancing dolphins renaissance of endangered flora and fauna in a nutshell mother nature is healing the message is crystal clear for modern human civilizations and its approach on sustainability let's align with nature in absolute harmony to enhance immunity to any such uh, to avoid any such future future episodes this is where india can become incredible again create experiences that reduce anxiety and enhance well-being india should own this space bring the world to experience and learn what we have create opportunities forums camps and keep exposing the world to this while infusing this into a current tourism treasure trove that already exists only in india is wellness multidimensional and proactive it is physical it is mental it is emotional it is spiritual it is social it is environmental in sum we need to blend our current tourism aspects with our ancient wisdom so that tourists can carry back a souvenir a new skill of ways to harmonious living a word of caution anxiety remains high and hence visible cues of safety and hygiene must be integrated in our message trust is the new currency moments of truth should be translated into moments of trust through visible through certifications etc just has been done in countries like singapore and qatar last but not the least a gentle reminder to all my industry colleagues limiting contact need not limit warmth we are not only providers of rooms and food but our theaters of experience where guests want to live emotion they create experiences specially personalized ones that will transport their senses to those different dimensions of happiness where memories are made we must uphold our ethos of atithi devo bhava there cannot be a better example than our humble namaste 
I quote from a piece I wrote titled Ode to Service in the New Normal. With heartfelt compassion and empathy, amply proven, yet harking back into the beginning of time itself, rooted in her touching, contactless gesture that stood the testimony of time, physical proximity notwithstanding. The Namaste, a gesture of supreme respect. The Namaste, silent yet powerful, distant yet connected, embodying within itself oneness of the soul. Thank you, Bhuvnesh, Anurag, and the entire BW team. I'm happy to have shared my thoughts with all of you at the 5th BW Hotelier India Hospitality Summits and Awards 2020, the IHA. A great initiative in its fifth year has come a long way in such a short time. Holding the awards during lockdown is indeed commendable. It demonstrates your commitment and sense of purpose. Both for the jury and the nominees, this event will be a case study in how this industry can come together at times of crisis. The virtual summit has some of the finest names in Indian hospitality. I have always relied in the power of an idea and I'm sure each one of you will have many such to brighten the way forward. Before I end, friends, we are proud custodians of our industry. Travel will return because of an important shift in consumption, an accelerated pivot from buying things to buying experiences. Let not the current forces damage the very fiber of the service industry and let us continue to serve with our hearts just as little Johnny does. Namaste. Um.